Hallelujah. It's so good to see you. Good morning. Hope you're warm this morning. It's a good cold day, right? Let's all stand to our feet. We get to come into the house of the Lord this morning with joy, with gladness. If you're hurting, that's okay. We want to come and worship the Lord this morning. May our mouths fill this place with praise, with your glory all the day. Sing this again. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yes. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy. I'm the women's ministry director here, and I just want to welcome you. We are so glad you're here this with, this morning with us um, just to worship the Lord. If you're a guest with us today, I want to tell you about a card that is found in the back of the seats that are in front of you. There's a wooden box. It's our Connect card. If you'll take a moment just to fill that out, we would love to have a record of your visit and also just know how we can connect with you. Um, on the back side of those cards is a prayer request slot. If you have a prayer need, please take a moment to fill that out because we would be honored to come alongside you as staff and pray over every one of those requests. Also, there's an opportunity if you're a visitor with us, whether this is your first time or 50th time to visit with us. If you would love to learn more about our church, we're going to have 
a Discover CFBC dinner this Tuesday night at 615. If you will call the church office and let us know that you're going to come by noon on Monday that, so that we can add you to that list, we would love to meet with you. As staff, you can meet with our pastor and learn just more about our church. Sam? During this time, we often celebrate various things. And during our CFBC 150 in the holiday season, we had two special days that occurred that we wanted to save and recognize them then, today because we didn't want to get lost in the business. We've had some anniversaries. It's not wedding anniversaries, but some people who have been with us for a while, like Amy Dobson. She's been with us for five years, and we're just so appreciative. Just so appreciative of what you have done in the women's ministry and first impressions. And this is Zach Tucker, our active Active Families Pastor, I got it right. He's been with us five years also, and we're just so grateful for these two. Thank y'all very much. And we want to continue celebrating in the baptistry. Well, good morning, church family. We are so excited to be with you guys today. My name is AJ, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and this is Becky Wilburn. And she is coming forward today in Believer's Baptism to tell you in the world that she is committed to following Jesus. She made that decision to follow Christ about a year and a half ago and just felt like the Holy Spirit was really laying it upon her heart to follow Christ's example and command. And so that's what we're here to do today. So Miss Becky, I'm gonna ask you a question. You ready? Yes. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen, amen. That's right, that's right. Well, then based on that profession, it is my privilege to get to baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen, amen. But we're not done yet, church. We got more in Miss Becky's family. This is Garrett Smith and his dad, Bert, and we are here today to get to celebrate another profession of faith. Garrett is 10 years old, and, and we kind of met. I met with him, his mom, and his dad, and we just talked through what he believes in, about Jesus and who Jesus is to him. Well, it was about two years ago that he, he really, you know, kind of prayed to receive Christ, and he's been following him ever since. Uh, but he's been kind of hounding his mom and dad about wanting to be baptized and just trying to find the right time. And today is that day. And so, Garrett, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Becky. You ready? Who is Jesus to you? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. That's right. That's right. We're here. Face this way. You ready? Because it's based on that profession of faith that it is our privilege, your dad and I, to get to baptize you now as our brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Pastor Joshua, take it away. Yes. 
just need to sing this with us. Would you stand? Let's all praise the name of the Lord together. to worship and praise Him today. We want to remember all that He's done, that this is our God, the one who is worthy of worship, who's worthy of praise, whose name we come to declare this morning. Let's come before Him, pouring out our praise, giving Him all that He has deserved. Remember those walls that we call sin, This is what he does. 
sing praises to the Lord. I love to hear you singing praise to the Lord. It's such a glorious sound to hear worship taking place in this room. I read this quote earlier in this week by the author J.I. Packer that says this. In corporate worship, that's our gathering here, the saints do not just merely seek God, but they also find Him. Worship is not only an expression of gratitude, but it also is a means of grace here, whereby the hungry are fed, and so that the empty are sent away rich. Isn't that powerful? I think I could probably pretty confidently say that not everybody who comes in here this morning is feeling extremely full, right? Can we be honest for a moment? Oftentimes we come to corporate worship, we may feel kind of empty. We may feel as though life is just draining us physically, emotionally. You may be walking through an incredibly dark, difficult time. Brothers and sisters, God offers that grace that we need today. He will fill those who are empty. He will enrich your lives more abundantly than you can even fathom. If you seek after Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sing this with me. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. See, this is worship to him. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a friend. Just open your heart. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something
When you turn to Acts chapter 4, you find Peter and John, they've been arrested in their standing trial for healing a man. And in verse 10, Peter says this, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, who you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Let's go to that. Let's go to Jesus. Father, we come right now, Lord, and we do praise you. Jesus, you are the Christ, the one who was crucified to pay for our sins. But thank you. Due to the power of God, you're not in a grave. You were raised from the dead. And Lord, you are the chief cornerstone, the one upon whom our faith is built, the one who provides hope, assurance, and salvation. Lord, you are the one who brings about healing. And Lord, you are the one who brings about salvation. And we come to you today empty, tired, and needing. We may not even know that, Lord, but we need you. We need you for healing, healing of the body. And Lord, we lift up Jim Wheeler, Patty McDaniel, Francis Dobson, Audrey Henson for Ronnie Jamerson. Lord, that you would bring healing in their life. Lord, we pray for Norma Valentine, who's going to have surgery. Lord, use doctors and nurses, but you get the glory. Lord, and there are people who need comfort in their grief. Lord, we pray for the Moggins family in the passing of Charlotte. We pray for Ginger Hughes in the passing of her mother and Bob Rice in the passing of his mother as well. Lord, bring them comfort. Bring them peace. May they sense your presence. May they feel your power. But Lord, as you are the one who brings about healing, you are the one who brings about salvation. Because we are dead in our sins. We are at enmity with you until your Holy Spirit works in our life and makes us aware of that and we respond in repentance and faith. And Lord, help us celebrate that today. That, that you are the one who has taken us from death into life. But Lord, there are those in this room who are still unaware maybe that they're dead in their sins, separated from you. Lord, help them overcome any barriers as they hear your word. Be with our pastor as he brings it. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. trust that you're staying warm, that you will stay warm in the future, and I'm just glad that you braved the elements and you came to worship today. I thank you for those who are worshiping with us on live stream, and I want you to take your Bible today and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 1. Today I want to speak to you on this subject in the form of a question. Who is Jesus? Finding the correct answer to that question is the most important pursuit of your life. Some of you may be here today and you've been a believer for many, many years. Have you noticed that our culture is always seeking to tear us away from the, the roots of our faith? Some of you this morning, you're searching, you're, you're looking for the truth about Jesus, and, and you've delved into a lot of different avenues to get an answer, but you're, you're, you're left wanting. I'm so glad you came to church today. I promise you, what I'm about to share with you today 
is truth without mixture of error. Let me tell you what pursuing the truth about Jesus will do for you. It will shape your whole worldview. It will shape how you view life. It will shape the decisions you make. It will shape the, your, your eternal destiny. I'll tell you, it's the most important pursuit in your life. And there are those here today, and you're a believer, and you're, you've become rather apathetic in your faith, and your faith was once a, a first burner, top burner issue, but now it's somewhere back here. It's not as important to you. My prayer today as we jump into to John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, is that God, the Holy Spirit, will light a fire in your heart and give you a zeal for Jesus once again. Would you bow your heads with me, Father, in the name of Jesus? I pray that everybody within the sound of my voice will find the correct answer to the question, who is Jesus? Lord, speak to our hearts today. I know that the Holy Spirit's ministry is to glorify Jesus and to glorify you, Heavenly Father. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will have freedom to do whatever he needs to do in our hearts and lives today. I pray the Holy Spirit would watch over the Word of God and take the Word of God and Use it in a penetrating way in our hearts and lives today. I pray that at the end of this service, as we worship you, that you will be honored and glorified with our response. So, Lord, speak to us today. We ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, in the Bible, this question, who is Jesus, surfaces time and time again. And it surfaces in many different ways. For instance, Jesus asked his disciples, who, who do men say that I am? And, and they say, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But Jesus said this, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He found the correct answer. And it made all the difference in the world in Peter's life. And then when Jesus commanded the winds and the waves to be still on the Sea of Galilee in a little boat with his disciples, and everything suddenly became calm, the disciples turned to each other and they said this, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Who is this? The religious leaders asked this question directly to Jesus. They said, if you are the Christ, tell us. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And when Saul, the persecutor of the church, was on the way to Damascus to arrest more believers and to persecute more believers, Suddenly, the resurrected Christ met him in all of his glory, and, 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 and Saul was driven to his knees and blinded. And, and you know what he asked Jesus in that moment? He said, who are you, Lord? Who are you? I can tell you that question has been asked ever since the first century. Who is Jesus? There have been a lot of wrong answers. There's been a lot of heresies around this question. Some say, well, Jesus was not God. Some say, well, Jesus was not human. And all kind of heresies developed around this question. It is very, very important that whether you're a believer or a non-believer, that you get this question correct. You find the correct answer. I'm not asking you today who is Jesus to you. I'm asking you today who is Jesus. Today I'm launching a series of sermons in John's gospel from 
John chapter 1, verse 1 through John chapter 13. And we're going to delve into this wonderful gospel. You know, it's interesting. There are four gospels in our New Testament. Matthew wrote for a Jewish audience And he presents Jesus as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Mark wrote for a Roman audience, and he presents Jesus as a servant who would go to the cross and bear our sins. And Luke wrote for a broader Gentile audience, and he presents Jesus as the perfect Son of Man. And then John wrote for the world. For the entire world, Jew, Gentile alike, and he presents Jesus as the Son of God. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, focus more on what Jesus taught and did, whereas John's Gospel, which was written around 85 AD, much later than the other Gospels, John's Gospel focuses on who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? This beloved disciple of our Lord reveals who Jesus is by highlighting seven of his miracles in this wonderful gospel. He reveals who Jesus is by recording his seven great I am statements. And then he reveals who Jesus is by including eyewitness testimonies like John the Baptist and others. We don't have to guess about John's purpose for writing his gospel because he records it for us. In fact, take your Bible and look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20, John's gospel chapter 20, and in verses 30 and 31, the Bible says, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. This is not an exhaustive recollection or biography of Jesus. In fact, John went on to say that if we tried to write everything about what Jesus said and did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to record it. Hey, if you're a born-again believer, don't ever get the idea that heaven's going to be born because for all of eternity, the Lord Jesus is going to be revealing more and more, more layers of himself to us. You'll never get bored in heaven. He'll reveal more and more of his grace, more and more of his mercy, more and more of his activities in and through your life while you were on this planet. And you will be blessed and in awe of Jesus. So he says, but these have been written, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, John used the verb believe around 100 times in his gospel, much more than the other gospels. And he emphasized that those who grasp who Jesus really is and place their faith in him will receive both eternal life and abundant life in the here and now. You know, the most famous verse that uses the word believe would be John 3, 16, wouldn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's desire for you is that you believe in Jesus and that you receive the life that only he can provide for you, the kind of life you've been searching for since the day you were born, the kind of life that you will never find in, in the bottom of a, a, a whiskey bottle, the kind of life that you will never find involving yourself in immorality, the kind of life that you will never find in pursuing career excellence. It's the life of Jesus, the life of God. In the New Testament, God's communication with the human race reached its crescendo. 
John's gospel highlights this in his prologue. Now, the prologue in John's gospel is verses 1 to 18 of chapter 1. The word prologue literally means the word before the word, okay? It's a prologue. I love what D.A. Carson said. He said, the prologue summarizes how the Son of God was sent into the world to become the Jesus of history so that the glory and grace of God might be uniquely and perfectly disclosed. The rest of the book is nothing other than an expansion of this theme. So who is Jesus? Well, God has answered the question for us, I'm proud to say. And here are some reasons that you should believe in Jesus and receive the life that only he can provide for you. Number one, what does he reveal about Jesus here in this first five verses? He reveals, number one, that Jesus is eternal in nature. Look at verses one, chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. No, notice that in the beginning. Now, what does that remind you of? Go back to Genesis chapter one, verse one. Just flip back there with me. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The same three words that you find here in John chapter 1, the first three words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we know that God spoke everything into existence from nothing. In the beginning was the word that word, that verb there was is in the imperfect tense and it speaks of continuous action, continuous existence of Jesus before the beginning. You see, Jesus had neither a beginning nor ending. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus has always existed. Here, here's, here's a heresy that's developed o- over the centuries. Some people believe that Jesus came into existence in Bethlehem when he was born uh, by, by the Virgin Mary. That is false. Jesus has been forever. He's the eternal son of the living God. Now, notice, in the beginning was the word. That's logos in the Greek. And in the beginning, God expressed himself, if you will, God communicated, and that self-expression, God's own word, identified with God yet is distinguishable from him, has now become flesh, the culmination of prophetic hope. Jesus is the word of God. Listen, the Bible is the word of God transcribed. Jesus is the word of God personified, okay? So God has communicated to the human race. God wants us to know who Jesus is. God wants us to believe in him, and God wants us to receive the life that only Jesus can give us. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, I started teaching through Hebrews this past Wednesday night, and I told the the, the group that was in, in the fellowship hall with me that some of what I say today is going to sound familiar to you. Why? Because it says basically the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, the Word, the Logos, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So who is Jesus? Well, the first thing we learn about Jesus is that Jesus is eternal in nature. The second thing we learn in our text today is that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at verse 1 again. In the beginning was the Word, And the Word was with God. The Word was with God. Once again, 
the verb is imperfect, suggesting continuous action. The, 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 the Lord Jesus has always been with God. The word with there can be translated face to face. The Lord Jesus has always been face to face with God the Father. He is God's eternal Son. And this describes a close, intimate relationship between God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus. Again, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, in these last days, has spoken to us, listen, in His Son. Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. In John chapter 5, verses 19 to 23, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus therefore answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son, Jesus is the Son of God, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, even so, the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he's given all judgment to the Son, so that all who honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son, listen, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, there is a clear distinction here between God the Father and God the Son. They're, 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 not, they're not one, okay? It's not the same person. We believe in a triune God. We believe in one God who has eternally existed in three persons, all of whom are co-equal, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Bible teaches that. Yet we're, today we see people who believe in this oneness, that, that there's only one God, okay? And, and excuse me, that there, there is one God and they're not separate persons within the Godhead. There's no, they don't believe in the Trinity is what I'm trying to say. And I'm telling you, that is, that is a heresy. The Bible teaches that there is one God who has eternally existed in three persons, and nothing can change that. That's the way it's always been. It was like that before the creation. And it'll be like that forever and ever and ever. Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not Jesus. But they're both God. Now, understanding this prevents one from entering into heresy. What we're doing is very important for young people. It's very important for adults. It's very important for children. We have got to make sure that when it comes to the question, who is Jesus, that we get it right. We got to get it right, and we got to keep getting it right as long as God gives us a breath in our body. Jesus is eternal in nature. Jesus is the Son of God. Number three, Jesus is God in the flesh. He's God in the flesh. In John 1, 1 and 14, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, look, look at this, and the Word, the Logos, the self-expression of God, the communication of God to the human race through Jesus, the Word of God personified, He was God. He is God. And the Word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In John's gospel, Jesus repeatedly 
assumed for himself the divine holy name that Jews would never pronounce the I am, the covenant name of God. In fact, seven different times in this book of John, the gospel of John, Jesus said, I am, I am. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the door. Jesus was claiming, listen, Jesus was claiming divinity and deity to those who would listen. I can tell you this, the religious leaders caught it because that's one of the reasons they crucified him, because he claimed to be God, and they could not stomach that. When Thomas addressed Jesus after the resurrection, remember, Jesus resurrected and he appeared to the disciples and Thomas was not there. And, and Thomas came back and the disciples, we've seen the resurrected Lord. And Thomas said, I, I, I won't believe if I, don't, if I can't put my, 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 my hand in his nail-scarred hand, hands and, and, and put my my hand in his side. I won't believe. Then about a week or so later, Jesus reappeared. The resurrected Christ appeared. You know what Thomas did? He fell down on his face before the resurrected Christ. And he's the first disciple to do this. He called Jesus my Lord and my God. Do you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't reprimand or, or correct Thomas. You know what? He praised him for his faith. You see, Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. Do you see now why the, the Bible says we should honor the Son the same way we honor the Father? Take your Bible. Just flip over. John chapter 14, just a moment. Look at it. Jesus said this. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus said some things that no ordinary man would ever say. Jesus said this, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Listen. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Boy, I'm telling you, that is a direct claim to deity. Jesus said, hey, guys, Peter, James, John, you guys, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. And then he turned around and said, believe also in me, making himself equal to God the Father. Jesus is God in the flesh. Colossians 2.9 says, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He's fully God, and he's fully human. Jesus was, is, and forever will be fully God and fully human. He's fully God and fully human in heaven today at the throne. You might ask, well, pastor, that's hard to understand. You're right, it is hard to understand. It's hard to, to grasp even the the. The, the remote parts of the, uh, of the Trinity and try to understand it. I love what J.B. Phillips had to say. He said, if God is small enough for me to figure out, then he's not big enough for me to worship. He, let me tell you, his thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. His ways are infinitely higher than our ways. So who is Jesus? Who is he? Well, he's eternal in nature. He's the son of God. He is God in the flesh. Well, don't you see what the Bible's driving at here? Don't you see the emphasis of John chapter 20, verse 31, the great purpose that John included at the end of his gospel? Believe in Jesus and receive his life. 
I, I can tell you that's what God wants for every person in this room, every person listening by live stream. He wants you to believe in Jesus, and he wants you to receive his life, supernatural, spiritual life. The fourth thing I want you to notice here today is Jesus is the creator. You say, wait now, Pastor. The Bible doesn't say Jesus is the creator. The Bible says that God created everything. If you if really, if you go back to Genesis chapter one, you find the Trinity. You you know that? You, you, You find the Trinity talking among themselves. Jesus was there, the Holy Spirit was there, God the Father was there, but the Bible says that Jesus is the creator. In John chapter 1, verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, does that not say that Jesus is the creator? John states this amazing truth about Jesus, both positively and negatively. Notice it. All things came into being through him. That's a positive statement about the creation of Jesus. And look at the negative part. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Listen, the, mo- the, 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 the farthest galaxies in the universe, Jesus spoke them into existence out of Nothing. The tiniest atoms within our bodies, Jesus spoke them into existence out of nothing. Jesus is the creator. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, for by him, that's Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens And on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Do you know why the universe doesn't just fly apart? Do you know why our earth still orbits around the sun like it's been orbiting around the sun since Jesus spoke it into his existence? You know why? Because Jesus is holding all of creation together. He's the glue that holds it all together. But one day, Jesus is going to say, enough is enough. And all that you see will be destroyed. And Jesus is going to create new heavens and a new earth without sin without the devil interfering and trying to mess our lives up, ruin our lives. It's going to be perfect and pristine. It's going to be the Garden of Eden revisited. It's going to be wonderful. Do you see why the Bible states that we should honor the Lord Jesus the same way we honor the Father? So who is he? Jesus is eternal in nature. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the Creator. And number five, Jesus is the author of life. He's the author of life, the originator, the source of life. In John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, in him was life. In him, in Christ, was life. That's continuous life. And the life, what? Notice these verbs, was, was. That's imperfect. It's, It's continuous. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Life is one of John's favorite words that he uses in the gospel. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we talked about it a moment ago. If we believe in Jesus, we receive what? Eternal what? Life. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have what? Life and that you might have it more abundantly. 
In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and what, church? The life. Jesus says, I am the life. I'm the life that comes from God. I'm the life that brings satisfaction to your soul. I'm the life that brings fulfillment. I'm the life that gives you hope. Now, Jesus used a word here, zoe in the Greek. And zoe refers to spiritual life. There's another word in the Greek, bios, and it refers to physical life. Now, you, you've got physical life, and have, have you noticed? Have you noticed that your physical life, as you get older and older, just sort of withers away, doesn't it? I mean, there was a time when I had black hair. <laughs> Seriously. There was a time that, that I had just a tiny bit of athletic ability. Not anymore. And you know what will happen to this life one day if Jesus tarries? One day I will die. This physical life will cease to exist. But the difference is, Zoe, spiritual life, if Jesus gives you life, you have it forever. And it's the best that you could ever have Zoe, spiritual life. I love what the Bible says in 1 John. Just turn over to 1 John just a moment. 1 John chapter 5. Look at this. Verse 10. The one who believes, John's still using that word believe in, in, in his epistle here. The one who believes, let, let me just make sure you understand something. The word believe, the verb believe, literally can be translated believe into, believe in. It, it's not static. Be, true faith, true belief doesn't just sit there. True belief moves into Jesus. That's the picture. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself, and the one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. What testimony? The testimony that Jesus is eternal in nature. The testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. The testimony that Jesus is God in the flesh. The testimony that Jesus is the Creator. And the testimony that Jesus is the author of life. Verse 11, 1 John chapter 5, and the testimony is this. Here's the testimony. You ready? That God has given us eternal life. Who did he give eternal life to? Those who believe in Jesus. And this life is in his son. This kind of spiritual life, you can't get it in pill form from a church. You can't get it from being religious. You can't get it by trying to stack up good works, hoping and praying that your good works will outweigh your bad works. This kind of life comes only... From the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Look at verse 12. I love this. He who has the Son has the life. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you trusted him as your Savior and your Lord? Then the Bible says you have this life and you will have it forever because Zoe never goes away. It never gets old. It never dies. He who has a son has the life. He who does not have the son of God, look at this, does not have the life. I say this with a broken heart. If you're watching live stream, if you're in this room, and if you've not believed in Jesus, 
You've not believed that he is who he says he is. He's who the Word of God says he is, who the Father says he is. You've not trusted him as your Savior and Lord. The Bible says, not, not Chuck, the Bible says you don't have this life. You don't have it. You don't have eternal life. You don't have abundant life. Because this life only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Notice, in him was life, back in John chapter 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It, it doesn't say here that the word was light. It says here that the life was the light of men. Light is God's life manifested in Christ. In John 20, 31 again, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, now listen, don't miss it, you may have life in his name. Let, let me tell you this. When Jesus spoke calmness over the, the raging Sea of Galilee, his light was manifested by what he said and did. When Jesus stood at Lazarus' tomb after Lazarus had been dead for four days and said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came walking out, let me tell you, the light of God was manifested through the actions of the Lord Jesus Christ that day. Notice the verb here in verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The word comprehend can be, can be translated overcome it, okay? So I want you to notice that that, that, that verb shines is the present tense, it indicates that the light has gone forth continuously and without interruption from the beginning until now and forever. It's still shining. Let me tell you this. Nothing, no devil of hell, no legion of demons can overcome the manifested light that comes from the life of Jesus. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Now, I can tell you this. If you believed in Jesus, you're going to be a winner too. That's, listen, that's why you've got to get this question right. You've got to get the answer correct. Who is Jesus? That's the question that's dominated the hearts and minds of people from the first century until today. That's also the question that is dominating the hearts and minds of young people. Generation Z, millennials, all gener boomers, I don't care who, what generation you are, this is the question that people are searching for the answer. Uh, Peter Jennings, when he was alive, had a, a special, The Search for Jesus. You remember that? The Search for Jesus. People are still searching today, friend. But the answer to that question, who is Jesus, we don't have to guess. It's in the Bible. It's in the Lord Jesus himself. The Bible is God's word transcribed. Jesus is God's word personified. We have the answer. Jesus is eternal in nature. Jesus is a son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the author of life. Here's what God wants from you right here today. 
He wants you to believe in Jesus. Not some kind of static, false faith, but he wants you to have an active faith. He wants you to believe into Jesus, and he wants you to trust him as your Savior and your Lord, and he wants you to receive his life. Believe in Jesus and receive his life. Now you've got to respond. You, 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 let, let me tell you this. Putting this off is not smart. It's not smart. Here, here's what happens. If you put this off on responding to Jesus, your heart could get harder and harder and harder. If you put it off too long, you miss the day of grace and you step into eternity with your sin still intact and your soul doomed to hell. That's fact. You got to respond. There are believers in this room, there are believers watching by live stream who have become apathetic about your relationship with Jesus. Man, there was a time when you were on fire for Jesus. There was a time when you read your Bible and you prayed. There was a time when you couldn't wait to get to church. There was a time when you loved to worship. There was a time when you tithed and you loved to be generous with what God provided for you. But now, it's sort of take it or leave it with you. It's not important to you. You know what the Holy Spirit wants to do? In the lives of apathetic believers today, he wants to set you on fire. He wants to inoculate you with zeal from God so that you can deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you. We're going to worship in just a moment. And I'm going to invite you to come to this altar and bow your knee before King Jesus. Say, Lord, Lord, forgive me for being apathetic. Lord, revive me. Renew me. Give me a zeal for you again. I can tell you this. If you pray that prayer and you mean it, that's a prayer I guarantee you 100% of the time Jesus will answer. That's God's will for your life. So you come today, you come to this altar. Don't walk out of here apathetic concerning Jesus. But some of you today are hostile toward Jesus. There was a time when something happened in your life. You weren't a believer. Somebody real close to you died and you didn't understand it. Or you, you lost a job or a career. Or the rug was pulled out from under you, and, and you've been mad at God ever since. You've been mad at God. And you haven't even thought about Jesus. But guess what? You're here today. You're not here by accident. You're here because the Holy Spirit brought you here to hear this message. And you know what? God is not up in heaven with his arm folded with a furrow on his brow because he's mad at you. The Bible says he loves you. The Bible said, Jesus said, uh, John said it right here. He wants you to believe in Jesus and receive his life. Hey, don't you think it's time to let it go? Don't you think it's time to quit being mad at God and believe in Jesus? Listen, I want to encourage you. You come to one of our staff. In fact, I want to ask our staff members to come, our worship team to come. You come to one of our staff members and you say, today, I want to believe in Jesus. I want to believe in him with all my heart. And then there's another group that I want to address. It's those who are searching. You're not mad at God. 
You just, you're just on an honest and, and, and truthful quest to understand who Jesus is. You want to get it right. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, what I've shared with you today is the truth. And the God who created you, Jesus who created you in your mother's womb, wants you to believe in him and receive his life. So you come to one of our staff members and we'll help you. Who is Jesus? You got to get it right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing gospel. Lord, I can't wait to study through this gospel. I cannot wait till next Sunday and pick up where we left off. Thank you, God, that you want us to believe in your son, Jesus, and you want us to receive his life. Have your way in our hearts today, Lord. I pray for those who are apathetic. I pray for those who are hostile, to those who are searching, oh God. Help us to act upon what we've heard today and receive the life that only Jesus can give us, the life that will never die. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship and you come as God leads you. Holy King Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore, I join with Him and bow before Jesus, only Jesus. I'm so glad that you came today. This is going to be a great study. We are, you know what one guy said? He said, the gospel of John is shallow enough for a little child to wait in. But this same guy said, it's deep enough for an elephant to dive in. The more you study it, the more God reveals to you. It's like you never come to the end. I can't wait for this. I hope you'll be here every Sunday. I hope and pray you'll come ready to receive what God has for you. 
I know this much. I know it is the will of God. It's the will of God that you believe in Jesus and you receive his life. Sam, close in prayer. This Tuesday night, we have Discover CFBC scheduled at 6.15. You can sign up at the office. But there is some weather coming in. And just to let you guys know that Monday through Friday, we kind of follow the school's lead. That if the schools are closed, we will not have events that same night. So if the school's closed Tuesday, we'll postpone Discover CFBC and same thing for Wednesday. All right. One day each week for 24 hours, the church sets a time for focused prayer, for the nation, for our church, for revival. You can be a part of it. We call it 24 Pray. Outside there's a table. You can sign up to be a part of it, get more information, or go to the website. The men's conference is February 23rd and 24th. We brought back some speakers that you men have been asking for, Matt Hess and Tim Jackson. You can go to the website and sign up today. And also the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home is a place where children are sent for a safe environment. And we partner with them. They have a place in Millington, and we try to fill the pantry. There are about 30 people who pull from that pantry. As you go today, there are some uh, lists on the camera stands. You take those and fill those. Make sure to look. If you're getting something out of your pantry, don't go to the back of the pantry. Look at your expiration date, okay, please? I'll still eat it, but they may not, okay? Uh, so you can bring those back on February 4th. It's an opportunity for you to minister to the orphaned the foster care and people who are waiting to be adopted. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come right now. Lord, we thank you for this word. And I pray that as we go, that we would live in a way that honored and glorify you, that it demonstrates that we have believed in Jesus and we have received his life. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who still needs to do that, let them understand that that's still an opportunity while they're here to speak to one of us. But bless these people as, you, as they go. Use them for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.